Anyway, my name's Tom Flanagan. Um, some of you may know me from agencies like Leo Burnett, and, uh, but recently I started my own company called Nut and Bolt, and uh, I'm getting back to the fun of creating content and consulting uh, global brands on their content strategies. Um, so today I'm going to introduce you to our panelists. Um, so what I'd like each panelist to do, and we'll start with Stephen, and we'll just go in order, introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, but I'm going to put you on the spot. I have a client. I, 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 so, I find it mildly annoying. Every time he calls me, he says, the first thing he says to me is, what's making you smile today? But like every time he calls me. So if he calls me three times in a day, he says it three times. And I'm like, all right, enough. But um, so I'm going to ask you guys to answer that question too. What's making you smile today? Hopefully that annoys you a little bit. Maybe that's a Philadelphia <laughs> thing with me. I don't know. But uh, Stephen? Well, I, I feel sorry for anybody who hasn't yet had a smile today. I've had one. And mine was in the last panel I did, uh, which was a VR panel just ended a couple of minutes ago. I sat next to uh, a woman who was uh, one of the key executives in making what I think is the best piece of VR I've seen to date. And as a medium that will grow only when there's great content leading us to want the next experience, she gave me my peak experience to date, which was the adaptation of Ridley Scott's movie, The Martian, done as VR, which wow. I just think. So that really made me smile sitting next to uh, an executive who worked on that. Very cool. And tell us a little bit about your job. Uh, I'm the Senior Vice President of Innovation at Time, Inc. We uh, were the time of Time Warner. We're a publishing company that partnered with a movie company years ago. We're a 92-year-old company, and when the new management came in, when we spun out of Time Warner, 95% of our revenues came from print, which uh, we see as a, a, de a declining medium over time. Uh, you can laugh if you like, but yes, it is, it is seriously a declining medium over time. And our job is to figure out how to be an omnimedia company in, uh, in a quick enough time to grow, uh, to become a growth company again, where the revenues we're taking in from new medias replace the dollars that we've lost from print. Penny? Hi, um, everybody. I'm Penny Baldwin, and I'm responsible for the Intel brand worldwide, along with all partner marketing and new technology marketing. Um, and it's a lot easier to make me smile, I think, today. All I need to do is get a text from my husband with pictures of our two border collies sleeping on my side of the bed. <laughs> Liz? Yeah, uh, I am Liz Wilson. I am with Under Armour Connected Fitness. Uh, Connected Fitness represents uh, the digital side of Under Armour's business. We have 165 million registered users on the platform sharing their data and telling us you know, when they work out, when they wake up, and what they had for breakfast. What's making me smile is um, I'm pregnant with my first and feeling the kicks. It's always exciting. That's awesome. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lori Tab. I run client services for CAA Marketing, and uh, there's a few things that are making me smile today. One is being uh, very close to my home, so I had about a five-minute commute here, which never happens, living in L.A., and uh, the other is really just the ongoing dialogue about evolution in media and marketing, because I think part of why I have stayed client uh, agency side for so long it's just lo the love for the variety and the change and the fact that nothing's ever the same and we, s we keep seeing that and that's what these days are all about. Great. Jason? Hello everyone, I'm Jason Drusenovic. I uh, head up innovation for Havas. Um, until recently I was the president of the New York office, but uh, recently they asked me to help uh, uh, in this new role, which is exciting. Um, what's making me smile today is um, uh, actually, uh, remembering how my wife felt when she was pregnant and um, being glad that I'm not there. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> no, it's That's a fantastic cool. thing. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, no, I have to say, that, um, you know, the, the world in front of us is at, at, at right now at an unprecedented time of opportunity. Um, all these new medium that, w that we're interacting with across digital, mobile, social, um, have created a, a frankly, a, a, a gold rush time, and the opportunity is now, and it's truly an exciting time, like I think never has been um, in front of us. Great, Carol? Hi, I'm Carol Chung. I'm with uh, Digitas LBI. I run the media technology practice there, which is um, close to 100 people, and we uh, 
do everything from campaign execution all the way to programmatic consultation in that tech. So, um, last thing that made me smile was his joke. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm just so happy to meet everybody on the panel today, and everyone's super nice, and I'm just excited to be here. So. Great. Um, so, I'm going to start, start out. Uh, I think what a, one of the things I want to do today is, is talk about a little bit of research and apply it to a question. So, for example, um, data-driven marketing. Everybody's talking about data-driven marketing today. Um, Liz knows all about that. And um, I, so I recently read that data-driven marketing led to revenue increases for 57% of marketers. So going forward, what potential advances do you guys see in how we target and measure effectiveness of advertising on any of the platforms that you know most of us here cre create for? Um, how are you guys at your companies uh, using data perhaps differently than you had in the past, and what's enabling you to do that? Stephen, why, why don't we start with you? I think in the data space, we have as a company two distinct advantages, um, and, I, and I imagine I should share my uh, interest in exploring those with, with the other panelists. One is that we're a subscription company. So if you look at all the subscription companies in America, the four biggest are the phone companies. You've got 120 million subscribers, more or less, at AT&T and Verizon. You've got about 80 million at, uh, at T-Mobile and Sprint. Some w next, you've got uh, Amazon Prime and Netflix at about 60, 70 million, somewhere in there. And then there's us. We have 33 million folks who've been paying us uh, for content over the last uh, several years. In fact, 150 million who've paid us within the last five years for uh, content. So we know, we, we have a relationship to customers, in fact, and a tremendous, uh, and with that relationship comes a lot of data that most other firms don't have. As a 100% print company until two years ago, we only used that data to sell magazines. Now we're figuring out how, we have a great opportunity to figure out how to harness that data to grow in, in, in another medium. And the second advantage we have is I do think that an interest graph, that what you read is a pretty interesting picture of who you are. And I, I, I suspect that we're just at the beginning now of our own learnings on mining the data we have by customer of what interests them, where their passions are based on what they read, and how to d super serve those customers. Great. Um, at Intel, Penny, um, you're doing some amazing things with data and content as well that you might want to talk about. You don't have to. But uh, if you wanted to address sure. how you're using data in your marketing efforts. Now, I've often said that in order to be an effective marketer in general, I think you have to be data-driven and customer-led. So the data that provides the insights about customer needs, wants, business challenges that you can effectively address. Um, we, uh, we're an engineering company, and as a consequence, uh, data is in our DNA. And you are not very credible as a marketer unless you come loaded with data um, uh, based on everything you're recommending or you're doing. So I'll give you one example of uh, data that we're looking at right now. We recently just launched a competition reality series in partnership with MGM and Mark Burnett, uh, the gentleman who's famed for The Apprentice, The Survivor, Voice, all of the competition reality shows. And we've launched it on both linear and digital platforms. And we're looking at content consumption, time spent, video views consumed, levels of engagement, and we're managing traffic flows and data between both the linear and the digital platforms. And, I, and the patterns that we're seeing in terms of content that is consumed at the highest rate um, then informs how we think about programming the show that then goes back and informs how we expand that kind of content on the site itself. AmericasGreaters.com, by the way, for anybody who's interested. So, and it's been actually, it's all our intellectual property. We, is not, the, we own it lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, we also pay for it lock, stock, and barrel, so I think we're entitled to that. Uh, but it's been really interesting for an ingredient brand to have that kind of direct customer engagement and to be able to get that data firsthand and use it to make our marketing efforts that much smarter. And Liz, at Under Armour, your CEO, I think, was recently quoted as saying, data is the new oil. 
Yeah, I mean, it certainly is. We, I mentioned we have 165 million people on the platform, and they're openly, freely, willingly sharing what they're doing on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So um, for us, it's a lot about the emotional connection that we make to these individuals um, and helping to inform their future decisions so that they can live their best life. Um, you know, we, we've we launched several connected devices, including the health box, which includes includes a uh, activity tracker, a scale, um, as well as a heart rate monitor. We've launched connected shoes. And so we have this moment-to-moment -moment data. People are waking up with us. We're telling them, like, you hit your sleep goal. You've slept well. Um, we're asking them questions like, how do you feel? And using that to inform uh, some of their decisions throughout the day. Uh, so it's not just, what did you eat? But how did you feel? And how does that connect us more closely to you? And, and Laurie, a CAA has, um, has grown from, of course, it, most of us know it as a talent agency first, of course, but has been um, very uh, sophisticated and very good competitor to a lot of advertising agencies these days in the marketing space. W what role does, does data play within your, your agency operations there? Well, it's certainly an important role, and I think um, I read recently that brands are only analyzing about 12% of the data that they actually have. So I think as it relates to the question about what we'll see moving forward in measurement, it's probably going to be becoming more and more predictive and less emphasis on the post analysis, more emphasis on leveraging the data to ensure that we're asking, we have to ask the right questions of the data in order for it to give us any information that's useful. But asking the right questions of the data and then using those insights to drive the strategy and the creative. And then I think the position of post-measurement becomes a totally different type of conversation because we've, we've leveraged all the predictive models that we can. And Jason, separating the useful data from the noise. Uh, it sounds uh, like I feel like plugging IBM Watson. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's, I, I can't not mention Watson in this regard. But, you know, as many of you know, we're in Washington, a sea of data. We live in a, a time of uncertainty now. Um, if it's 12% of the data that we record, um, that some people say 80 to 90% of the data we see out there, we don't know how to read. Or it's, it's mysterious, it's dark, it's, it's without self evident value. So it becomes about the systems of pulling the needles out of that haystack of big data. And, and right now, brands, companies, publishers, all of us are, are, are seeking ways that we can find those insights. And increasingly, the, that's coming through stuff that you wouldn't expect. Um, social media, individual influencer perspective, um, and, and co broad cultural trends are, are being extrapolated at, a, at an incredible rate. So we have to build solutions that enable us to see those, uh, those, those, those insights and do that at scale. And one of the things that comes out of that is the less relevance of advertising, or I shouldn't say less relevance of just advertising, but it becomes more about the platforms of engagement as opposed to just an interruption-based media. And so that, that can enable uh, companies themselves to evolve, think about things in a different way. Um, and I think all of us on the panel here are, are, are seeking how do we find those tools? How do we use those? And then the byproduct of that is happy customers, happy clients, and, and hopefully good stories. And, and Carol, Digitas is kind of the granddaddy of uh, digital and data in a lot of ways. Um, how have you seen that change over the years? Um, so you took about the first half of my answer. <laughs> so we've seen a lot of work, um, clients and advertisers collecting DMPs, organizing DMPs. Um, everyone can, you know, acknowledge that data is extremely important. I think where we're following down and I think where we're going to see a lot of emphasis in the next 12 to 18 months is about activation. And so, um, you know, right now we're in a world where we're taking human assumptions, creating segments, pushing that into the space, um, creating groups of people to target and, and figure out what to message and say to them. And I think where we're all actively working towards is, um, converging all of the different platforms that we have that can kind of make decisions for us and create a centralized kind of AI platform um, that can in one place say at an enterprise level, here's what you're trying to sell, here are your ROI goals, here are the consumers that we're touching, here's what we know about them, and this is what we should be saying to them. And so I think we're all actively trying to get to that point as quickly as possible. Uh, Tom, to, uh, to Carol's point, there is somebody on this panel who I think if they gave Oscars 
for how to build a business from data would have gotten one in the last couple of years, and that's Liz for Map My Fitness. Yeah. And, and uh, it, it would be great, mm -hmm. I think, especially following Carol's comment, to yeah, have thanks. Liz talk a little about that experience. Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't accept that, Oscar, but I, I thank you. That was really nice. Um, I think you have to thank the Academy. Yeah, thank you <laughs> to the Academy. Um, so actually, a couple of things that were just said, uh, you know, we, we also work with IBM Watson, so we make sense of that data with, with IBM Watson as a partner um, to help inform the consumer experience. So that way, you know, when you sleep seven hours a night or eight hours a night, uh, bless your heart that uh, you know we're telling you we're informing you about what that means for your life and how you can how you'll feel that day um, the other really interesting thing is that you know a lot of a lot of people talk about data today what what Under Armour has done is is really kind of uh, leverage this platform of 165 million people to capture a different type of data. So it's not just age, it's not just gender, it's not just where you live. It truly is that kind of deeper notion. Like, for instance, we know um, we know when women are pregnant because we can see like a slight uptick in their weight. Um, I'm maybe pers talking from personal experience here, but you can actually kind of see the data. Like they stop drinking, they gain a little bit of weight. Um, that's not usually the, the case when you stop drinking. Um, but we can actually talk to those people in a different way without kind of just creating some broad assumptions. So that's really where where we're focused in the future and able to kind of connect brands um, more specifically with the right individuals in all of the right moments. Um, since we're all marketers, uh, we, we have to talk about ad blockers. Um, I think most of us think it's generally a good thing, but we'll see here what our panelists have to say. Um, so I was reading that 21 million people downloaded ad blocking software in 2010 and what I read said it's about 200 million now. Um, Adobe research suggested this could cost advertisers certain tens of billions of dollars. They used a 41 billion dollar number. Not sure how accurate that is, but no doubt there's, there's, there's an impact. Um, the, the question is, is this the, the news that branded content and native advertising, dare I say, has been waiting for? Is this going to make us better marketers? Um, by default in some cases. Stephen, your business uh, is appropriate to talk about. Well, I mean, my, my, my angle on ad blocking comes from the fact that now 65% of the folks who engage with our content digitally are on mobile devices. So I have to be very conscious of watching what's happening in the spaces, especially as we're an advertiser-supported company to a great degree, that to, as we put our content out with ads, the idea that there are disruptors out there is a problem. I mean, my worry about what I'm starting to see in the ad blocking area is that they'll, they're going to do themselves in. I mean, the question is who does themselves in first? Uh, I'm, I'm starting to see from some of the ad blocking companies that it's like the godfather. Um, if you pay us enough, your ads won't be blocked. I, I think I've seen that movie. Uh, on the other hand, what you've got is uh, the fact that mobile advertising is just not that good. You know, if mobile advertising were at the level of Super Bowl advertising, you couldn't get people to block it. So somewhere between those two facts, we try to navigate a strategy. Jason, you know, from an, from an I, innovation and well an agency standpoint, both. The ad blockers are good, um, and, and by that it, it is good for a couple reasons. One, consumers themselves want to engage with good stuff. Advertisers need to make good stuff, otherwise it won't work. So if you have to force yourself to make better stuff, because if you don't, it won't be seen, then we do our jobs better. So it's a good thing. Um, for me, it's, it's self-evident that we'll, it will come to a place outside of marquee things like the Super Bowl and Oscars and real-time sports and some things which, of course, that we look forward to from an advertiser standpoint. We will increasingly live in an on-demand world and everything we access will be when I want it and how I want it. Um, so that displaces the traditional advertising function. 
Um, thus, you need to move to a way that you have relevance for your brands, and that means you have to do platforms of engagement or things that enable people to want to deal with you. In many ways, the box is a great example of that. The, uh, this is the Under Armour box. It's a connected system of fitness. is a platform. It's not necessarily an advertisement, but at the end of the day, you're going to buy more shoes. You're going to buy more shirts from Under Armour because um, you're going to want to do these things that make you better. So, summary, the, the ad blocking platforms force advertisers and clients and brands to become more relevant. Um, sometimes that means you don't do ads. Sometimes that means you do platforms. And if you do do ads, they're really good because if they don't, they won't be seen. And I think that's what you see with Facebook now. Everyone talks about Facebook and how Facebook ads are good. That's because they're not ads like ads of the day for the most part, although you can insert a 15 or a 30 if you really want to and you pay them. Um, but they're, they're made to understand while they run silent. Um, so they're made to be seen on a mobile device, not even in landscape or, or portrait format, so you can see them in your feed. And, and, and they're highly, highly um, uh, personalized and to you, so they're, they're much more relevant. That's the type of things that are enabling that. And um, one last comment, and then I'll stop. Is uh, back to your uh, Godfather reference. What's the digital version of the horse in the bed? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question I would ask. Uh, something to think about. Something yeah, to something think to about. not think about. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hey, um, hey, so Carol um, it, and Lori as well. So in your business, do clients ever? I mean, not all of us are hopefully. I mean, um, do clients ask you about these issues? Do they come to you and say, hey, what are, we gonna, what are you guys going to do about all this ad blocking stuff? For, you know, how do we know our ads are going to continue to reach consumers? Uh, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, I can't count how many POVs I've had to write about ad blocking recently. Um, theoretically, I would agree that there might be a result of improvement in advertising as a, you know, as a result of this kind of new technology. Um, but I, w I have to say, I think, um, I'm all for decreasing the amount of people between the advertiser and the end publisher and consumer. And I think that um, ad blocking and kind of the financial model that they've been proposing, which I think is very interesting, um, it kind of is a distraction. And um, <clears throat> you know, I was, on, I was on a panel the other day where, with an ad blocking company, and so what they do is they basically say to these publishers, I can whitelist you if you uh -huh. want to give me a percentage of your advertising spend. Wow. Which is really not related to quality of advertising, it's, it's just... Distortion. Pretty much, <laughs> you could look at it that way. Um, but what I think, what I tell my clients is at, from an advertiser standpoint, you know, it, it has created more interest in native content marketing. Um, we've been looking at inventory that can't be blocked, such as mobile app inventory today. Um, but I think really what it does is it disrupts the value model that we've created in digital, which is free content for consumers paid for advertisers. Um, and so I think uh, what we're really waiting for is publishers like Time and the CBSs and all these other guys to stand up and say, either you consume our content for free with our current advertising model or, yeah. or we'll block you and you have to pay a subscription model, but we have to stay in business somehow. So I think it comes back down to the I think the Washington Post has taken some leadership in that, if, I, if I'm correct. What's that? I think the Washington Post has taken some leadership in that. They now, yes. uh, when you consume content on the Washington Post, they say, you've got to watch this with advertising because that's how we can pay to do this. Yeah, And, and, and that and comes now, from a digital owner. Yeah, and there's some technology popping up now where they'll determine if you have an ad blocker on and you can't move forward into the content unless you turn it off. So. Wow, new world indeed here. I would just say that um, I think it's, it's not a new story that consumers are looking for ways to engage with the content they want to engage with, um, whether it's my father who's in his 80s still complaining about the fact that cable TV has ads because he believes cable was sold to him based on the idea that it was going to be ad-free, <laughs> or whether it is, yep. you know, the, the new kind of thinking around ad blocking. It, it's also the reason we started our business at CAA Marketing, and, and at then it was TiVo. And so it was really looking into what's the relationship between brands and content creators, because if we tell great stories, the brands will get their messaging through to their audience. And so um, I would say clients do ask us about it, but they also are coming um, because they want to find ways to engage their audience through great storytelling. And Penny has a brand that advertises. What's your perspective? Oh, I'm going to say something heretical now. <laughs> 
Um, I, I actually am a big fan. I would like to get to a point where we significantly diminish our paid advertising placement. Sorry. Um, in favor of branded integrations, um, proprietary content, engagement models with the consumer that are dependent on, on creating interesting stories that compel their, their involvement. So, well, that's not a reality today. I think we live in a hybrid world. We can't possibly say it's got to go all the way to proprietary content and zero advertising. That's just not realistic in order to achieve the scale and exposure that we're looking for. But that's certainly the end destination we're aiming for, and we're starting down that path in lots of ways. Um, I'll give you one example besides America's Greatest Makers, which I already mentioned. There's, we are embarking in a whole series of technology integrations into the sports business, and everything from snowboarding to the NBA to the Major League Baseball, where our technology radically transforms the experience you get as a broadcast viewer or as a person in venue. In exchange, we want access to the content, and we plan to monetize that content. So that's an example of how I think we are heading in the direction that I referred to. Great. Um, so there's a word I have to get out of the way. Millennials. <laughs> there you go. Right. We're done. Sorry. It had to be said. Um, but now that I said it. Now moving on. <laughs> I wish that we could. Um, that's the digital horse. In the <laughs> Sorry, that's great. Uh, according to CES, just 55% of young people uh, use TV as their primary viewing platform. So streaming devices obviously dominate their, their habits. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about Periscope, Meerkat, um, so that kind of live stream. Periscope says uh, 10 million people download the app and 2 million people use it every day. It's the latest I could find. 15% um, of top brands on Twitter use it on a regular basis. 15%, 10 million people. Um, product demos, webinars, focus groups, breaking news, behind the scenes content. Have you guys seen anything compelling when it comes to, to Periscope? I mean, how often does it come up in your business live streaming, you know, whether, whether it is as a publisher of content, a brand, or an agency? If I may start. Um, so we run a gaming competition, competition called Intel Extreme Masters. It's held in four countries um, every year, culminating in the tournament playoff in Poland. And um, there are a half a million people who attend these things. They, they compete 13 hours a day, if you can believe that. But the real craziness is the live streaming factor. While there might be a half a million people who attend the event, there were 75 million combined streams uh, on, uh, that, that ensued from that competition. So the, the scale and exposure for a, a highly lucrative gaming target is just mind boggling. Do you guys use I mean, Periscope, Meerkat, and, you know, from, a, from a journalism standpoint at all? Well, we do, in, we cover live events as part of our day jobs. We cover, we're, we own People Magazine, so clearly we have a relationship to the Oscars and the degree to which we can cover the fashion shows for InStyle and the Oscars for, uh, uh, for People and Entertainment Weekly are important to us, but we don't particularly use Meerkat and Periscope. Uh, in fact, what we did was, we realize that the third live camera at the Oscars is the Associated Press. You have E at the Oscars broadcasting live. You have the network ABC broadcasting live. Associated Press also broadcasts live. So we've partnered for the next two years with the Associated Press on their live broadcast. We think there's uh, you know, a terrific role for live in aggregating audiences or just simply being uh, uh, an aggregation play in terms of collecting a lot of content, interviews with a great number of celebrities, let's say, at the Oscars that then get cut up into small pieces and distributed socially to our millennial audience. Carol? Um, <clears throat> so I think what we've seen in TV is kind of the evolution of appointment time viewing to kind of like on demand when I want to do it. Um, I think what has survived is live event streaming. So if it's based upon an event that you care about, from eSports to the Super Bowl to the Oscars, seems that people are willing to rearrange their schedules, right, and kind of they want to tune in. I think what's interesting about Periscope and you know, these types of partners, it kind of brings that ability to 
live stream at a user level, right? Like a personal, like here's my life and I'm live streaming it now. And I think, I think what we're seeing is that there aren't all, you know, unless you're, you know, somebody with, you know, a million followers, there probably aren't that many people who are willing to tune into my life at this exact time while I'm walking down the street and having a moment that I want to share. So I think it's more about like how do you capture that, record it, and then someone can kind of watch it later, which we're seeing with other platforms. Unless your name is Kardashian. Exactly. <laughs> which it's not. Jason? So we've experimented with a few things um, with brands, um, and it's still in the experimental space right now, but um, when you look at any new emerging technology like this that is in these stages, um, it's disintermediating a previous uh, ecosystem. And, and by that I mean, if you compare how torrents used to drive how people downloaded and then now over the top streaming solutions have made that legal, we will see similar things like that moving forward. But the biggest numbers you see on these streaming things are for things that you can't figure out a way to pay for. for so for example, from a consumer point of view, yeah, they might st stop into Kim's stream and watch out what's, what's going on with her and Kanye, but for the most part, it's like, I want to watch the Champions League and I can't figure out a way to do it. Or um, I like this type of sport that's not in my region. And so it's, it's circumventing pay, paywalls. Um, and thus, there is an opportunity there. So if um, th those brands that figure out how to, how to make that valuable um, will we'll, we'll be involved in that. But for now, it's, it's an enablement factor for a problem that exists within the, within the ecosystem. So, so I think that where you're going to see it benefiting is on the enterprise side, where companies want to use it to save expense on not flying to a conference. You know, you can watch the stream of the training, or um, you can uh, uh, use it as ways to share information around in private networks. Those type of things, I think, are going to become much more relevant in the short term, and we're seeing that now even, you know, when we're doing global creative reviews, where we'll have a, a streaming global creative review and not fly in the guy from wherever to, to review it. Um, so that coupled with, you know, cloud technologies are enabling a different way in which medium, uh, the media is being utilized. So, but the revenue streams, I don't know if it's going to go to Periscope, F Facebook Live, you know, Ustream, you know, or what, but the platforms that are going to be built on top of that will be the ones that be, we'll be talking about next year. Well, I, I think one of the interesting areas, you know, from a from a an IP from a legal standpoint that, that has come up with with let's say Periscope, for example, uh, are at live events, of course, you know, and uh, NFL is a, I think a good example of that. Um, although Twitter is going to live stream Thursday night shows, they're, they're concerned with the fans and you know holding up their phones. So now they're they're blocking those live streams from from leaving those stadiums, as I understand it. Um, but on the other hand, some teams like the Jacksonville Jaguars, they use a live streaming product from a company called Stream, brilliant name for a streaming company, um, and they allow the fans to stream up to the big screen, but they can't stream outside of the stadium. So, um, and it's a good enterprise solution, right? There's a couple technologies that are enabling that to happen. Um, I plug IBM, my client, and that they, they ha are doing that in, at Notre Dame and at the Atlanta Stadium, where you're able to view the a view from the guy down in the front who's got his phone out there and he's filming a, a view of the touchdown. And you imagine that great Giants catch last year when um, you, he caught the one-handed um, pass that changed football. If you were able to see that point of view from the guy on one side, I would want to see that. So right now, this is what, what I was saying about it. Uh, I can't access that outside of the stadium, but I want to, and you know, as soon as I can figure out a way to do that, I probably would, because I'm you know, interested in that type of thing. Um, that's interesting. Right now, it's not really, hasn't scaled yet, right? Uh, but I think we're, we'll see those locally within events, and you, sometimes you see it at concerts, too, where you can see like, what's happening in the other tent. You know? um, uh, and so th there's, there's experiments, but early days, right? Early days. We, we can't stop you from getting music for free, but we could stop you from streaming outside of the stadium. That's interesting. Uh, Lori, how about some uh, client examples, some things you've worked on? Yeah, I was just going to mention that I think uh, a lot of it right now is experimental and uh, as relates to kind of a part of an overall program. So last Friday we um, had a very small um, concert, private concert in a Chipotle store in advance of the Cultivate Festival, which was going to be in Phoenix uh, on Saturday and Sunday, and invited customers to have an opportunity to be one of the less than 100 people that were able to come attend it, but then leveraged Periscope to live stream it and had a much wider reach in a market, and I think it's a way in that case besides expanding reach beyond the, you know, the, the small intimate setting that we had set up, and there was a reason for that strategically, but also a way to not let people feel like they missed out necessarily, or to at least, 
you know give people more opportunity to feel a part of it um, but we are still doing cultivate which is a huge huge live event in multiple markets because live experiences continue to be a really really important part of uh, reaching customers let's talk about social media um, I said social media and millennials in the same thing. Yeah, it's great. Um, so social media, throw out another fun stat. For every 100,000 followers on Facebook, only 130 people will click on an organic post, yet 78% of marketers are satisfied with Facebook ads. Um, so there's social media advertising, and there's the term social media. Like the term digital, uh, digital simply became kind of a common thread to everything that we did. I mean, when I started out in business, of course, digital was this four weirdos down at the end of the hallway, um, and then we became the weirdos. Um, but uh, but then we didn't even use the word digital. You know, in the last few years, we you know we we obviously it's been so integrated, and I, and I see that happening with, with, with social media. I feel stupid saying social media anymore, right? Um, so. Um, and I think it's a misnomer anyway, social media, but that's another story. Um, so it's always been about communicating with consumers on their terms. So when we talk about the evolution of social media, what, what have you guys learned? Like, how have you seen it evolved? And, and am, I, am, am I right? Is it kind of following like digital? It's just, it's, it's there. It just has to be integrated in everything that you guys do. We're a content company. We want to see our content on every platform. So we engage heavily. We turn out 600 posts a day. And I'm sure any of you who engage, as most of you probably do, with Facebook and Twitter, you see an enormous amount coming from People Magazine, People.com, Time.com, and so forth. So we, we use it as part of our reach to, uh, to, you know, to, to some degree, a new audience. I mean, the digital reach of Time Magazine, I think, is fully 15 years younger on average than the print reach. And this is a great, we see this as a great success. We see this as an opportunity to make our brands relevant to new audiences. Well, it, it, it's another thing. Um, uh, I remember clients telling me, make everything sticky. Remember those days? It's gotta be sticky, it's gotta be sticky, make it sticky. And now we wanna make it slippery, to your point, right? And so that's how social. How about, how about you, Penny? How have you seen social change, like in the last two years in your, in your role and at your company, um, are, are, are you seeing a different kind of approach to it, a different shift now that the kind of, the luster's worn off? Um, I don't know that the luster has fallen off. Uh, for us, social is absolutely vital. Um, it, is, it is a way that we amplify our efforts, where, where we drive what we call long tail exposure. Um, so uh, social example uh, we did a technology integration amazing technology meets amazing creativity and the Lady Gaga performance on the Grammys it's the single biggest social media night of the year you're crazy if you don't take advantage of that channel and that discipline to really scale the exposure of your efforts and we did we did lead up aggressively on digital and social channels and the numbers were just obscene I mean the, the exposure that we got from that and the, and the jump in the brand metrics that we drove were over the top so it's it's vital Liz how do you encourage people to share yeah so ours is like ours is a little bit different so you know I mentioned our brand connected fitness um, and oftentimes we kind of lean on the side of digital connections being you know we connect with over 500 different devices to date but there's also the side of it that you are truly connecting with your friends your peers in an authentic way um, so the conversation our, our own platform which is social in nature is really really authentic and and the conversations that take place there are organic to to that side of of the business so you know a great example of something that we're doing right now is uh, a virtual challenge that we call you versus the year um, it's under armor hosted we have over 700,000 people participating in it worldwide and they're trying to run a thousand kilometers over the course of 2016 and this is a passionate passionate group of people around the world who are truly sharing in this experience trying to achieve different milestones and so the conversation that we can have with them it's it's 
it's truly vital um, because it's creating that relationship between us and them. Um, but it's done through a, di a slightly different way. It's not it's not the traditional means of you know Facebook and Twitter, but using our our own platform to do so. In our experience, I would agree with Liz in that it's it's all about the authenticity. So as Penny said, it's vital. You can't not be communicating as a brand, leveraging social, but it needs to be authentic to the brand story and to the brand values. And so I think what we're seeing is at, at first something that felt like it was very all about individuals, then brands starting to get onto the different platforms, and then in some cases brands maybe being either in places or appearing in ways that aren't necessarily supportive of who they're trying to be, and so it leads to customer confusion or backlash and that kind of thing. So more and more the conversations are around what is the role of those specific platforms and what, what story is it going to tell that help ladder up to the overall story that we are telling. And for Havas and Digitas, but how, how does, how does social now internally um, from a role standpoint from a team standpoint uh, are they more are they, are they more integrated than they were two years ago to everything that you guys do sure um, so from a paid social standpoint uh, it's become increasingly more important to integrate with all of the other digital marketing efforts um, as we talked about earlier data is so important to our advertisers now so you want to collect as much data as you can um, you want attribution across, here's my investments across all these different digital platforms, what's working for me, how is it working together, rather than looking at things in a silo. Um, I think where social still needs to do some work in terms of kind of where we influence and push is how do we get more tracking, how do we get more numbers and data through um, from these platforms, which, you know, they usually aren't sharing as much back as we'd like. So I would add, and I agree with everything everyone has said, um, but I would add if, if you come to the conclusion that I've locked my social strategy, you're dead. Uh, and by that I mean it is continually and ever evolving at all times. I've learned that um, if you want to see where the future of social is going, talk to your 13-year-old niece at the party. Um, and that's probably the biggest, big advice I could see, tell you right now. Um, for brands, you, you can't get caught in your own hubris of thinking that people care about what you have to say. They don't. Um, so you have to tell something that's relevant to them in the right way, and that speaks to your authentic, authentic points. To bring it back to the ad um, blocker a comment from before, effective communication of content in social isn't being seen as an advertisement by the younger folks or the, you, the, the digitally savvy people. So um, they, they think ad blocking is irrelevant, yet they're engaging with a branded ad or experience within the social um, platform. So it's, it's how you say it that's interesting, I think, not necessarily whether or not you do, but the, the way in which you, you say it. Let's talk about content marketing. Um, another statistic that depends on how you look at it, it says a lot. 75% of marketers generated positive returns from content marketing, yet only 12% of marketers believe they have high performance content marketing engines. Um, companies like Dis Disney invested $400 million into Vice, and now I think just today or yesterday announced the deal with ESPN. Um, Vice can tell perhaps stories in a more authentic, more timely manner than ESPN can to a particular audience. Complex, another one that has a somewhat similar audience to Vice, uh, was just bought by Verizon and I think Hearst Media. Um, so when we look at content marketing, I think even the the ESPNs, the Disneys, et cetera, recognize uh, there's a, a, a lot more to be done. Um, but let's talk about how this great content can get produced short of just acquiring uh, a, a, a company like a complex. Um, what impact has internal production departments had uh, on the content creation process? Uh, how, do you all, how do you guys work with a mix of production companies, agencies? How do you get content made uh, at, at your companies. And let's just start with Stephen and, and for the sake of time, just go right down. Sure. <clears throat> Easy answer. Uh, content manufacturing is all we do. 
So, and, and we're definitely waiting for Havas and Digitas to call and say, we've just occurred, it's just occurred to us that you've got a thousand full-time writers in that building. Oh, we know. Who are turning out. Oh, we know. Who are turning out content. So yes, so we, uh, we see this as part of the bright future for the company is that uh, there is a, now a, a definite turn toward integrating content and marketing, and uh, we are one of the great content engines out there with the largest publisher in the United States. That's your, point. That's your business. Um, so for us, we're increasingly developing our own content as a way to connect directly with consumers and businesses that we serve. Um, and the way that we're getting it done, and for, you know, apologies to my agency partner and brethren, but um, we're increasingly building out that capability in-house. We have a capability called Agency Inside, and the reason that we do that is given the complexity of our technology and the need to translate that technology into stories that are compelling for people, not boring them into an understanding of what we do, but rather compelling them. And uh, between the complexity of the technology and the speed and the pace of business, I know every single one of us in this room probably sit in meetings all day, make a thousand decisions, and that you know hit repeat five days a week, and by the end of the week, the whole world has changed. So given the velocity and pace of business and how rapid things are moving, by keeping um, that capability in-house, we're able to keep the content engine going at, at, at a speed and a pace in a way that's relevant. I, I call it, we need, we need a constant march of chronic content, and you can only do that um, through an in-house team. Yeah, so again, I'm speaking from you know the brand partnerships perspective, but uh, we see content in a couple different ways. It's not just uh, necessarily producing video content or um, written content, but also content that people truly engage with, like the You Versus the Year Challenge, where we're talking to them throughout the year and having that authentic conversation. Um, a lot of our brands also come to us uh, and want to engage with our engage with content that's super relevant to the platform and use some of our data to help tell that story. Um, you know, one of the one example that I have is uh, on the CPG side of things, uh, Serial, uh, you might know, has not been doing so great over the past couple years. Uh, and so what we actually did was we did a big deep dive into, into our data to figure out what makes a successful user on the nutrition side. And what we found is that people who eat cereal, and a successful user is someone who comes within 5% of their goal. Um, so successful users were 20% more likely to consume cereal on a, uh, every morning, and those people who chose the right cereal were 30% more likely to achieve their goals. So being able to use that data and then tell it back with our brand partners is really, really powerful. That's, that's a great story. Um, Eat cereal. <laughs> yeah, we're, I mean, we're seeing the same thing. Uh, obviously, sitting uh, with a inside a talent agency, we represent a lot of production companies and a lot of those clients are coming to us and talking to us about relationships that they're establishing directly with brands. And, and our role really is uh, to help our brand clients figure out what the best solutions are for them at any given point in the, in the chain of content that needs to be created. So sometimes they're doing it in-house and we're helping to inform the strategy. Some cases we're helping to partner with the production company that can do that. Um, you know, by giving them options that seem like they'll meet the needs that they have. Um, but it, it really is a spectrum, and certainly we're noticing a similar uh, thing as you pointed out and as you spoke to Penny about uh, more and more brands wanting to do that on a really fast, fast turnaround in-house. And, and there's, there's content that should be done that way. And, and for the agency folks, you so talk about your reliance on production, depart, uh, production yeah, partners and how it's changed. Um, for us, content's kind of like social. It's one of those things you, you have that's in all the briefs now, and you have to have a, a, uh, your response. But um, we're open in our general approach and work with third-party publishers, work with content syndicators, um, and also work with our own uh, content creators. Um, we have internalized a lot of the function, tried to break the model by um, buying the, the primary production companies that we had been outsourcing to, and then extending their capabilities through the new media. So, for example, um, VR, AR right now, everybody's got a startup. It's like the new artisanal um, thing. Um, every agency has to have an AR, VR point of view as well. So um, you continue to look at the new mediums as a way to tell the brand stories. And as long as you're open in, in terms of thinking about the, where that authorship 
and ownership of that content can come from, you can have more relevant stories. Uh, a summary strategy statement is it's not always about, it's not about being always on, it's about being relevant. And sometimes that means not publishing. So that's the lesson I would say. Um, the, the, uh, the, last, the, la the last point is um, in regards to the embedded teams. We're seeing a shift in, um, in agency client relationships um, a lot now where we're working together um, with federated um, specialists within our units, client side, and sometimes cross agency um, internally within the client teams to develop programs like content authorship, um, innovation, transformation, um, and even, even experimenting in startups within inside the companies. And so that's a way that agencies themselves can, can try to change their model because we know the, the old model's gone. So we have to experiment with these new models. Um, and sometimes that means that you go and, for example, we have some of our clients that have teams of us inside their, um, their uh, behind the firewall that actually work um, at, in what we call tours of duty um, inside the client, you know, parachuted in, if you will. Um, <clears throat> so I'd say, um, you know, I think sometimes when you think of content production, it's a very long process and expensive. Um, one thing that we've created is called the Snackery, so it's snackable content. Um, and so, for a lot of our clients who don't have the budgets, or you know, really maybe aren't that kind of that kind of sexy content generating client advertiser, um, you know, we can take things like white papers, for example, and how do you turn that into something like an infographic or, you know, a 30-second video that a user would. Um, be more interested in interfacing with rather than like a 20 page white paper. So um, we do things like that, very quick turnarounds, it's fully automated online. Um, and also just like how do you optimize your own content too, that's something else to think about. So you might have a vast library of things, but are there tweaks or how do you take your worst performing content and what could you do to it to make it better? So. Um, I hate when we run out of time when there's questions, so show me your hands who might have a question, and based on how many hands I see go up, we'll either take questions now or we'll have one more question. Okay, I'm gonna, ha I'm gonna, what do you guys wanna do? You wanna take questions? Or yeah, you, yeah, bring them on. Tired, I'm tired of hearing myself talk, so. <laughs> um, let's, let's start with you, straight in the back there. Um, for those of you who didn't hear, um, effectiveness um, and usage of Snapchat and Twitter. Oh, I, I could start, start with the we're, agency. Yeah. We, were, um, <laughs> we, were, uh, we were talking about this right before the panel, actually. I um, was, was joking, I, you know, I did a snap right when I was up here and was saying, you know, I'm trying to figure out how, to, how, to, how this whole thing works because it's become such a, a thing of the moment. Um, and we have seen great success with especially FMCG companies and those that are tar targeting younger um, folks of younger mentality um, as an effective medium. There's some great content stories, um, great publishers that are, that are using Snapchat to tell stories in really innovative ways. So um, we're, we're bullish on that. I wasn't a year ago, actually, interestingly enough, um, but uh, I met some of the guys there and they seem to really be um, uh, pushing a different way, a different uh, wrinkle on it. Uh, regarding Twitter, um, I mean, time will tell. Um, they're they're really trying to to reinvent themselves. Um, you know, I, I hope that they uh, don't end up being a, a Harvard Business case study on how things went wrong. But um, they, right now, they're still very very much part of the ecosystem and um, are still considered valuable, um, especially in some specific demographics and, and personas that you're trying to reach. Um, they can be very 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 successful. Snapchat? Come sure. on, Snapchat. We, I said millennials. <laughs> um, no so um, one of my clients, Taco Bell, just celebrated their three-year anniversary Snapchat like just a, lot, a week ago. With down the Taco there. Grande? Yeah, right. And Quesalupa, anybody? <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I think they're doing some really interesting things. They're definitely working out their advertising model. I think the whole discovery engine within Snapchat is very interesting, especially for publishers too. And it's an interesting way to push content in more of a you know branded way rather than just kind of buying advertising amongst you know just you know, social. So I, I personally use Snapchat to get news and sports mm -hmm. updates. That's all I use it for, though. Shocking as that might sound. Um, for here.
Consumer data, who has it, who's selling it? Well, the consumers have it. Um, and they're the ones that are giving it up. Um, you know, I think you, 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 there's many sort of uh, on the media side of the business, you can buy and, uh, and have access to a large amount of, of consumer data. But the real value comes out of when consumers want to give you their information in exchange for relevance. Um, smart brands have, uh, and publishers and um, clients have an approach to managing personal information in a, in a, in a way that's based on ethics and integrity. Um, there's also a dark side of the business that is not based on that. So um, it, is a, it is a hot area right now, especially if you think about global brands. How things occur in Europe right now is it's, it's really interesting. There's a large backlash against, um, against this and, um, and we often have to deal with that in terms of globalization of, of, of our accounts um, because the way in which you handle personal information is really, really important right now. Yeah, I think your question was consumer data, who has it? So I can, I can say emphatically we have it. Um, but uh, we're really protective of that consumer data because that that's a relationship built on trust that we have between us and our consumers. So uh, it's not something that we take lightly. It's, it's not something that we are, are, are selling off by any stretch. But we invite our brand partners to come in and uh, you know use our data in really smart ways to talk to specific individuals on, on the platform. So everything that we do stays on platform at this point. On the end. Plastics. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Hamilton. <laughs> um, it's not a silver bullet, man. I think everything's different for everybody. Um, my, my approach is um, there's there's not a holy grail. Um, you know, will will Snapchat become the next Facebook? Maybe. You know, but I think we're going to live in a fragmented universe of multiple channels, multiple platforms, um, and you got to build the right thing for 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 the brand and for the for the client and for the user. That's my point of view. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's a value exchange, right? So, like, what value are you providing to the con customer or the consumer to want them to interact with you? And I think um, you definitely have to look at things like, are there platforms, are there new experiences that I can bring to people that don't exist today, um, brought to you by, and then that kind of creates this relationship, and then, you know, it's another way to build a relationship with the user. So, um, I think there's new opportunities that we can source all the time. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a single, like, this is what you should be doing. Yeah, the way that we think about it on our end is um, it's sort of a utopian Venn diagram of what's right for the brand and what's right for the consumer experience. And if we can find that moment in the middle, that's really where it makes the most sense. So, um, you know, the you versus the your challenge is a great one because we're rewarding consumers along the way, along their journey. Um, we have a couple other things launching this summer uh, that bring a ton of value to the consumer experience experience with the brand first. So we really try to get creative and think pretty pretty critically and strategically around what we can do uh, for our brands in that way. Yeah, I, and I would say don't, don't underestimate the, the, the trust and affinity that consumers have with brands. I mean, I could say Coke, half the room weighs their hand. I say Pepsi, 25% of you raise your hand. Uh, um, but, you know, I work with 21 NFL teams. And I like to tell the NFL, nobody cares about you, they care about their team. That's the brand they care about within the NFL. Um, that's why people share information with Under Armour, et cetera. And then from a brand standpoint, that's a heavy responsibility. You don't want to end up being Target, where all of a sudden you get a, you get a call or a letter, or somebody has your credit card information, sorry. Um, now how do I feel about Target? So um, it's, a, it's a huge responsibility that these brands have now. and so. Um, their number one job, in my opinion, needs to be to protect that data. Yeah, and, and if I understood your question, I don't think it was, I didn't hear it as specific to branded communication. Uh, in, as we're looking at next big things, one thing I'd point to is I do think in 2017, 
we're going to look back at what happened in this presidential election and see what role earned media played against a huge amount of advertising which seems to have accomplished very little. Um, and I do think we're going to take a fresh look at um, what was it in that story that resonated so loudly that it literally couldn't be uh, overwhelmed by any amount of media you threw at it, threw against it. Well, that's a whole nother panel. That would be a <laughs> yeah. fun one right now. I think we all look forward I'd to love to be part of that. Um, any other questions? Is anybody? Right, thanks very much for your time. Appreciate it. Take care. Yeah.